Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, welcome to the continuing education session, Ironing Out the Details, Beta Thalassemia Landscape, Emerging Treatments, and Payer Considerations. My name is Curtis Lucas. I am a Director of Medical Drug Strategies with Evernorth. I will be serving as your moderator for the session today. Uh, this session was de designed to achieve the following learning objectives. I would recommend using the mouse. And as you can see here, these are the learning objectives. I'll give you a second to read them. Um, I'm sure you can read them a whole lot faster than I can. Okay. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Vertex Pharmaceuticals. And these are the disclosures. As you can see, there are none. All AMCP education must be con conducted in a manner that avoids the fact or appearance of conduct which may violate antitrust laws. Please refer to the antitrust policy located on the website. For today's conversation, we'll be joined by Jennifer Billings, Director of Clinical Pharmacy at IPD Analytics. And to start things off, Julia Mahler, a clinical pharmacist with IPD Analytics, will be starting our conversation. And our good friends at IPD develop comprehensive pharmacy and therapeutic management strategies supporting manufacturers, payers, providers, and suppliers. So I'll hand it over to Julia. Thank you, Curtis, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, my name is Julia, and I'm excited to be here, albeit on one leg, um, to talk about beta thalassemia. Just looking at our outline, I will go over background, treatment landscape, and pipeline, and then I'll hand it over to Jennifer, who will talk about payer management and some of the exciting innovative contracting and payment models. To talk specifically about beta thalassemia, this is a rare inherited blood disorder, and it's really characterized by ineffective erythropoiesis, or making of red blood cells. We can broadly classify beta-thal into non-transfusion dependent and transfusion dependent. So non-transfusion dependent is sometimes called beta-thal intermedia, versus transfusion dependent is called beta-thal major, or even Cooley's anemia. And the differentiator here is that non-transfusion tends tends to be more mild um, and occurs later on in life versus transfusion dependent, the hallmark is really these severe life-threatening anemia symptoms by age two. To look at the epidemiology, beta thal does affect a specific patient population. So it is more common in Mediterranean countries, North Africa, the Middle East, India, and Central and Southeast Asia. So worldwide, we would estimate that it would be about one in 100,000 births, and then looking into the US, because of immigration patterns, it makes it difficult to really assess epidemiology. There are more immigrants on the coasts. So for example, rates in California are about one in 55,000 births. And the CDC does estimate that there's about 2,000 beta thalassemia patients in the US, of which 1,500 are transfusion dependent. And then there is an ICD code. However, it doesn't differentiate between transfusion dependent and non-transfusion dependent. To look into patterns of inheritance, this is an autosomal recessive gene char disease characterized by mutations in the hemoglobin beta gene. There's two main types of mutations. Beta zero is correlated with absence of beta globin production. Beta plus is correlated with reduced beta globin production. However, I say correlates here because either type of genotype can be classified as either transfusion dependent or non-transfusion dependent. So there is a little bit of fluidity in these definitions. Beta thal is a really complex disease, and it does lead to quite a few different disease complications. 
So looking in the top left hand of this slide, it's really characterized by that ineffective erythropoiesis or making of red blood cell. So the patient's bone marrows are going to be very hectic and they're going to expand. Um, and because of that, you're going to have bony problems. That's going to lead to anemia. So we'll see the classic symptoms of anemia, right? So impaired development, exercise tolerance, poor perfusion, poor quality of life. And then the body is going to sense that it's anemic. So what it's going to do is that it's going to increase iron absorption in the gut. But remember, the anemia is due to red blood cells, not, iron over, not lack of iron. So the increased iron absorption isn't going to really help. And in addition, we're going to treat the anemia with red blood cell transfusions, which is going to lead to even more iron overload. So these patients are really going to be battling iron overload. The damaged red blood cells is going to cause vascular disease and just a hypercoagulable state. So these patients are going to be at increased risk of blood clots. So I would say that the takeaway from the slide is that beta thal is much more complex than just the classic symptoms of anemia that we would see. And because of that, it's going to require really specialized care with multiple specialists. And because this disease does start in the early childhood, we're going to need to make sure that we have an adequate transition from pediatric specialists into adult specialists. And with this complex disease comes a high disease burden. There is definitely a quality of life issue with these patients. The red blood cell transfusions last a full day. There's travel to and from the center. There's also time for cross matching and sometimes IV iron chelators that are needed. The patients also need access to a center of excellence or a thalassemia specialist. And then between the red blood cell transfusions, a lot of times they still have ongoing anemia symptoms. Because of the multi-organ complications, they're going to different types of specialists and constantly getting scans of their body to look for the iron overload. The most common cause of death in these patients is heart failure due to the iron overload in the heart. And because of that, the median age of death is about 45 years in these patients. From a payer perspective, when we look at healthcare costs, the costs of transfusions themselves aren't too high at about $22,500 per year. A study in 2017 did estimate um, mean healthcare costs around $128,000 per year. However, these patients are living longer and newer, more expensive treatments are being developed. So the total lifetime cost, the highest statistic I saw was about $2 million. Now to pivot into treatment landscape, I would just like to get an idea of how familiar everyone is with the treatments for beta thal. So one being the least comfortable and 10 being an expert. <coughs> Okay, nice. Um, so now we're going to go into the treatments. Looking at the treatment paradigm, I'll say off the bat, the focus of this presentation is going to be on the transfusion dependent. And this is because there are, that's where a newer, more expensive therapies are being approved, so more interesting from a payer perspective. The non-transfusion dependent patients are still going to get periodic red blood cell transfusions. Um, this can be due to stress, infection, pregnancy, a growth spurt, or maybe just an increase in anemia symptoms. And because of the red blood cell transfusions, and because they still have that increased GI absorption of iron, a lot of times they still need iron chelation therapy. Many patients choose supportive care with a hematopoietic stimulating agent like hydroxyurea. We see a hemoglobin response in about half of patients who try hydroxyurea. And then we do have curative therapies, but we see that more used in the transfusion-dependent patients. So with transfusion dependence, they're going to require regular blood cell transfusions and then regular chelation therapy. And then some of these other treatments I'll go into in more detail in other slides. The last two points I'll make is that with the non-transfusion dependent population, they still have symptoms of the anemia and red blood cell destruction. So for them, we're really focusing on treating the vascular disease. However, with transfusion dependent, we're treating the anemia with the red blood cell transfusions. So in that case, we're really battling the complications of the treatment, so the iron overload. And then the other point I would note is that there is fluidity here and that non-transfusion dependent patients oftentimes do become transfusion dependent later on in life. 